Our New Testament lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 14, verses 1, and then skipping over to 7 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. When he noticed how the guests chose their places of honor, he told them a parable. When you are invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit down at the place of honor in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited to be your host, has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both of you may come to you and say, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take a lower place. But when you are invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher and then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He also said to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors in case they may invite you in return, and you would be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. The word of the Lord. Having grown up in the South during the 1960s, my friends and I all learned certain things that were expected of you. These were seemingly everyday, ordinary sorts of things, but they were behaviors that polite society had come to expect and to demand from the next generation. For example, if you were going to walk through a doorway and another person was also entering the doorway, you always let the older person go first. And if it was a woman, you had better hold the door open for her. When you were addressed by an adult man, your reply had better include the word sir somewhere in there. And if it was a woman, you'd always call her ma'am. Children were expected to be seen and not heard. They were subtly, and sometimes not so subtly, let known that they were fortunate to be part of a family and that their lives rotated around the world of their parents and not the other way around. <laughs> parents were the driving factors about what went on in a family. Simply put, we were to learn our place. Strangers who came to town who didn't know their place, who didn't know the local social rules, were greeted with the phrase, phrase you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> Our gospel lesson today is a message directly from Jesus, teaching us how to know our place. He chose an understandable, homespun illustration to help illustrate an eternal truth. Back in those days, at a dinner, the guest of honor sat on the right side of the host. The second most important person sat on the left, and then the third, and the fourth, and so on. Now, if a less distinguished guest arrived, say they got to the feast a little early, and they took the best seat in the house, if a more distinguished guest showed up later on, the person who had taken the best seat would be told to move. Certainly an embarrassing moment. So if you took the prime spot and you weren't the prime guest, you'd be humiliated by being asked to move. But in the parable, Jesus tells us that if you humble yourself, that is, if you deliberately took a less distinguished seat, especially one at the bottom of the pecking order, then if you were asked to move, you'd be moved to a more distinguished place. And instead of being humiliated, you'd be honored. 
much better to choose humility over prestige. Humility has always been a mark and a characteristic of a great person. The English poet and novelist Thomas Hardy was paid enormous amounts of money by many publications to publish his stories and his poems. But when he submitted his poems, he always included a stamped, self-addressed envelope so that the manuscript could be returned to him in case it was rejected. Despite his greatness as an author, he was humble enough to know that his work might be turned down. For sports fans here, what bothers you about athletes today? Do the players who don't know the meaning of the word humility bug you? It sure bothers me. With my background in basketball and having been an NBA scout, there were many times when I scouted a player and my notes I would write would be a terrible teammate. You know that type of player. Always wants to draw attention to themselves. Hogs the ball. Doesn't pass the ball. If they do something good, they pull on their jersey. <sighs> I was like, at football, they take off their helmet and they yell like they did something really great, really important. And I would think, you know, in a basketball game, so you just scored a basket. Just go on about your business. There was a football coach who told his team, when you get to the end zone, act like you've been there before. <laughs> Humility is appreciated in sports just as it is in the rest of society. The person who is self-important, who thinks themselves greater than another, is the lesser person. There was a famous, very, excuse me, very famous Scottish minister back in the 19th century named John Carnes. And it is written that he would never step onto a stage first out of politeness. He would always insist that others went before him and he would follow them onto the stage. Once as he was stepping onto a platform, there was a great burst of applause from the crowd. And he stood back and he began to applaud the person who was on stage with him. He had no idea that the applause was for him. It was no act. He thought for sure it must be for the other person Why would they applaud for me? So how do we retain our humility in a world that tells us we need to promote ourselves and let everyone know just how important you are? Well, we can start by realizing the facts. No matter how well we're educated, no matter how much we think we know, we know very little and the sum total of all knowledge. No matter what we've achieved, we still, in the end, have achieved very little. No matter how important we think we are in our jobs, when we retire, the work will go on just the same. We had a person in public relations leave the college a few years ago. Her husband was in the Navy and, and was being transferred and, so she was having to leave the college and we had a going away party for her. I thought she had done a great job for the college and I was really sorry to see her go. And I told the president of the college that and I said, she really did a great job. And he said, yes, she did. She did a great job. And so will the next person in that position. No one's irreplaceable. At night, on a clear night, when I'm taking out the trash or walking the dogs, I'll, I'll stop and I'll, and I'll look at the stars a little bit. I like to do that. Now, some people tell me when they look up in the night sky at the rest of the universe, it makes them feel small and unimportant. Not me. I look at all that creation up there, all the stars, the planets, the galaxies, and I think, 
How mighty God is. What a creation. And I get to be a part of it. I'm here because he cares. Is that humbling? Oh, it sure is. The God who made all of that made you. And for that, I'm very thankful. We can also retain our humility by comparing ourselves with the one who is perfect, Jesus. When I hear a Nobel Prize winner in economics give a lecture, or I hear a Hall of Fame basketball coach give a clinic, I realize just how little I know. How many people have wanted to throw away their golf clubs because they didn't think that their performance measured up to what they'd seen on TV from the pros? If you're learning to play an instrument and you hear a master musician play, you return to practice with a great appreciation for just how outstanding that instrument can be played and the humiliation of knowing you're pretty far away from getting to that level. (laughs) So if we set our lives next to Jesus, the Lord who is Lord of all that is good, we see our own unworthiness in comparison to the radiance of that holiness. Pride dies when self-importance takes a back seat. The second part of the parable that Jesus told is about giving. We're asked to give to those who cannot repay us. And it calls us to examine the motives behind our generosity. A person can give simply because they feel it's a sense of duty. Now, there's an old poem that, that goes like this. He dropped his penny in the plate and meekly raised his eyes, glad the week's rent was duly paid for his mansion in the sky. Some folks give to God in the same way they pay their income tax, a grim duty they can't escape. Second, a person can give purely from motives of self-interest. Whether consciously or subconsciously, they regard this giving as an investment. So really, they're not being generous there. It's a form of rationalized selfishness. A third reason for giving is to feel superior. This kind of giving can be cruel. It allows a person to look down on another person. Charles Dickens, in his novel Bleak House, has a passage where there's a wealthy man walking down the street, and on the corner is a beggar. And the wealthy man looks down at the poor man and he reaches in his pocket and he gives him a coin. And nothing is said. And the wealthy man looks down at the poor man and complains to him and says, you didn't even thank me. And the poor man responds, it's you, the wealthy man, who should thank me. Because giving to the poor allows the wealthy man to feel good about himself. It relieves his guilt. There's an old Jewish saying said that the best kind of giving is when the giver does not know the recipient and the recipient does not know the giver. That way the person is not giving out of their own desire for recognition and praise. The late Nobel Prize winning economist Gary Becker wrote that there's a reason Parents and people uh, don't give children presents anonymously at Christmas or on birthdays. Why don't they give it anonymously? Because they want the kid to know who to treat well. So is it generosity or is it a bribe? A fourth reason for giving is because the person simply cannot help it. That's probably the best way to give. If the person gives to gain a reward, that's not really giving. But if a person gives with no thought of a reward, then that parable tells us 
that their heavenly reward is certain. The only true, pure giving comes from an outflowing of love. Think about God's gift to us. God gave because he so loved the world. And so should we. Humility and generosity are traits we'd probably all like to have. They're not always easy to acquire, though. Seems like they move counter to what our natural will is and certainly counter to what our society shows us as examples. But when we submit ourselves to God, the Holy Spirit will work in us and help us to become who God wants us to be. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.